welcome back to Shop Talk, um, your source of ideas, insight, and inspiration for independent retailers. Um, our next section uh, session features two retailers whose stores have helped. <laughs> There we go. We've obviously got our cues all lined up. Um, so as the voice of God was just saying, uh, we are here for Meet the Retailer. We have two retailers, Zoe Anderson from WA Green, which is a shop in Shoreditch, and Victoria Suffield from the Hambleton in Winchester. Uh, WA Green has been called dopamine, a shot of dopamine for the home. Uh, she's been going for a year and it's a maximalist store that features independent designers alongside powerhouse brands. And the award-winning The Hambledon is located in a beautiful Georgian Tudor, Norman, perhaps a tiny bit Roman building right in the center of Winchester. It has a hugely loyal following um, and it's been described by uh, the uh, news website the, the Pool as a bit like your cool friend who's always heard of the best new brands. They're going to be talking with the long-standing design critic of the Evening Standard, Katie Law. So, over to you. Hello, everybody. Can you, um, can you hear me all right? Um, please put your hands up if at any stage you can't hear one of us, because there's nothing more irritating than sitting at the back and not being able to hear. Um, so we've got Zoe here in Victoria, and um, what's brilliant about having them together is that in some ways they give a terrific contrast to each other, because Victoria has had her store, the Hambledon, for a long time, and Zoe has hardly been going for any time at all, just over a year. year. So um, we're going to start just by hearing their stories, I think it'll be really interesting, um, and then we're going to go on and talk about what they look for, um, what challenges they face in this um, sometimes difficult climate for retail. So let's start with Victoria. Um, tell us when you started, how you started, and what your idea originally was. Well, uh, I probably first, first started at about six weeks old because my mum had a shop and she took me to work in a basket and put me under the counter just after I was born. So I did that bit of retail when I was tiny um, and then did lots of other things, started to have my family, didn't want to be in London anymore, moved back to Dorset, worked with my mum and set up a mail order business and we had a weird concentration of customers in Winchester and that was my market research and we opened a shop in Winchester. And I started for a year running it as my sort of a branch of my mum's business. But I think the demands of, although Winchester's not like a proper city, it's a little provincial city, but it is a city. I think the demands of the Winchester business were very different from the demands that my mum had in rural Dorset. So I separated the business from my mum's business and that was 19 years ago and we've been going since then so yeah so a lifelong history. and, and um, for people who don't know the Hamilton I expect you probably all do but um, it the interesting thing I think is, is the sheer breadth of things that you sell from fashion and accessories to home to books to, to give us just a, a, a brief overview of, of what your concept is for the stories? Well, I think I, I always really want to please myself. It is slight, yeah, it is a bit selfish. So I thought I'm quite interested in fashion, but I'm interested in my home. I like reading, uh, I'm interested in magazines, and I just think I wanted to kind of have a shop that reflected the whole of my life, not just a little bit of it. And my mum's shop, had always done a little bit of everything. And I kind of thought, well, we, you know, we're in a city now, we can do that, but on a bigger scale. Um, and then, you know, some things came a bit later, menswear 
was a relatively late edition, but I mean, that was probably 10 years ago now. So yeah, it was just about creating a whole thing and kind of making, making the Hambledon a kind of world, I think. Yes, and I mean, I think this is clearly something that um, a lot of people who start their own businesses do, that they want to start something in essen essentially for themselves, or they've seen a gap in the marketplace. And certainly, Zoe, um, your story uh, has something of this in it. Tell us why you started, what, what, um, what, what you were looking to do. Well, a, a bit like Victoria as well, my family were also retailers, so my grandfather had um, a chain of greengrocers all across the southeast, and then my father opened a cookware shop in Brighton and um, Seaford on the, on the south coast as well. So retail's always been part of my life, but I went into advertising, and it's interesting how I've come back to retail. Um, my story is that I was trying to buy something for a very good friend of mine for her 50th birthday, and I couldn't believe that in London I couldn't find something that was affordable, original, and represented my friendship with, with, with this woman that I really adored. And I ended up, I was racing around the east end of London, racing around Shoreditch, and thinking, this is insane, everything looks the same. Ended up legging it over to the Conran shop at 5.30 on a Saturday afternoon. And even in there, I was thinking, really? <laughs> so, um, I went on a trip to California and totally fell in love with the breezy aesthetic that they've got going over there. Um, they, um, the way they work with their craftspeople there is so accessible and so celebrated and it's so inclusive. So I re that really felt, it just struck a chord with me that um, I didn't feel that that was really being done very well in the UK. Um, so I, that was kind of my starting point. And to tell us a little bit about the store itself, um, how, how you found it, but well, that's really hard, goodness me. So, you know, you've got no retail experience, you've got no backers apart from your own bank account, and you've got to try and compete with the ASOPs, the Labos, the everybody that's looking for premises at the same time as you. It's incredibly difficult. We put together a, um, a render of how we thought our shop would look, um, we came up with a brand that's changed dramatically since we first put our little package together and just contacted every single property agent we knew in London um, and we got very, very lucky, got very lucky. And tell us, um, this is very charming detail, I think, about the name of, of, <laughs> of the shop and where that comes from. So. Um, it's, the shop is called WA Green, and I've been to it, and I can vouch. It's absolutely. You walk in, and it's a little, it's a, a little world uh, of, of of dopamine. It's a, it is a truly a dopamine hit. You walk in, and there's just so much stuff going on in quite a small amount of space, which feels very intimate and exciting at the same time. Thank but you. Um, tell us um, how you thought of the name and, and that story. So, I mean, you had to think about how it's going to stand out. London is incredibly competitive, and everything that we sell, we try and ensure that in some way that there's a thread of a story running through it. I'd like everybody that works in the shop to know exactly the origin and the story and the reason that I chose it for, 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 for the shop. And that was important with choosing the name as well. So. Um, I wanted it to have a sort of legacy and permanence to it, so I named it after my grandfather because he had 12 or 13 different shops and they were all called Elizabeth and he was called, he's William Arthur Green, so um, he left the army with a small amount of money and set up a business and it was a florist I think and um, it had a name above the door called Elizabeth and lots and lots of tissue paper and all the bags said Elizabeth so he said well can't change that. <laughs> so, they were, yeah, so, so I called it after him. So um, we've got Victoria with a shop business that's been going since 1999. Yep. Zoe with a shop that's been going for just over a year. 
Um, Victoria, what would you say since you started? Obviously, we're moving faster than ever with all sorts of different challenges, both in the external market, but also with things like online and the competition and the economy and social media and so on. Yeah. But what would you say over the period since you started have been the, the biggest challenges and how you've addressed them? I think when I started, it was just simply turning over enough money. We, we've got enormous rent in Winchester, which is difficult. And I think to begin with, I was very, very cautious about buying enough stock, selling enough, and it, it just felt very, very precarious. And then I was extremely fortunate to find um, an accountant that a friend recommended, and he's a sort of atypical accountant. And he said to me, you're never really going to make enough money unless you buy enough stock. And he sort of gave me license because I think I'm, a, you know, I'm probably slightly risk averse. And I think he gave me license to go out and buy a bit more than I was comfortable with because he said, and he was kind of like the teacher, he said it's sensible. If you buy it, you will sell it. You can choose it and people will like it, you just need to have the confidence. So I went out and bought a bit more, and we sold a bit more. And so from then, it could really grow. But I think all the time I was being very, very careful, it really hampered what we could do. Mm. So yeah, that, that helped me. Um, and then I think, you know, you're absolutely right. There are enormous, challenges at the moment and it feels like they're coming from all different angles you know there is obviously the online thing which we have all got to address but I think there are issues over high street rents and how independents are treated and I'm not quite sure how you legislate for that because I think you know it's difficult to put some dictator in place who says yes we need to value this independent over this multiple. I'm not quite sure how you sort of enshrine that in law, but I feel like there should be something done to support independence because we are very often used by councils as kind of shining examples of retail within a city. You know, they like a flagship multiple, but those run of the mill multiples, they're not really interested in. They then like to sort of showcase us as sort of leading independence, but I don't feel that we necessarily get much trade-off for that. Um, yeah, I think you know there are there are lots of there are lots of things lots that are problems. difficult. Yeah, and and so what about you? I mean, you so you um, you know you said earlier that you were going into retail having had a career in advertising, so you were going in not entirely blindly, but fairly so, and you. Um, and you're in Shoreditch, which is sort of super hip and trendy. And you know, what have been the biggest surprises and, and, and challenges for you in the last year? I mean, the, the challenge is physically still getting people through the door um, and getting people to come back. It is recognizing that I've got, I'm now starting to have a core customer base of people, of returning customers, but they always want you to have something new. So it's that balance yeah. of having mm -hmm. enough stock and new stock and thinking to myself, crikey, those sold really well, shall I buy another 24? Or, no, no get something new. So, it, 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 and, and obviously I'm very new to it, so it's understanding what is going to sell, and I'm starting to get, and it's that difference between, it's that dichotomy of buying for myself, and then buying things that I know I can sell, because it's that you know, you've got to get that, got, got to get those sales. So whether I may not necessarily fill my own home with plant pots that I can retail for twenty-two pounds, I've got to sell enough of them because I need that. I need yeah. that till to keep ringing. Um, so it, it's that balance of, of trying to present that aesthetic that makes me happy, and I feel that the customers want to surround themselves in, but then trying to keep it commercial. Yeah. And you, you would, would you agree with that? I would absolutely agree. I think you have the plant pots, and then, I mean, we're quite fortunate in that much of our business is women's wear. So 
there's a natural cycle with that and it used to be every six months and now it's really every three because people are doing pre-collections so the shop sort of reinvents itself at least on the first floor simply by virtue of the product that we're selling so we try and tap into that on the homeware side of the business look at what the sort of key fashion stories are and then try and sort of shoehorn homeware into that same story so we'll have core lines the plant pots that you know that will sell year round and we have to keep in stock and then over that we'll lay the seasonal stories because we've got so many regular customers they want to come in and go oh my god it looks amazingly different mm. and actually fundamentally it's quite similar mm. but you, you've got to put in those sort of key new but things I'm to always, make people go oh my god amazing. I'm always surprised by the number of customers that come in regularly and then because you've re-merchandised they suddenly see the shop completely oh differently and, and they're like how they, long have you had this exactly. it's amazing it's like oh we open with this yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah. So that's actually that's quite a good. I would have thought that's a really key piece of advice, which we're going to when we conclude. I think we we will will hit on the sort of top tips. But that's a very interesting thing about refreshing the look, the displays, yeah. um, and then obviously um, you're both here presumably with keen eyes on everybody's, perhaps not everybody's, but on 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 what's. Um, being presented at Pulse, and you spend a lot of your time, I think, going to other trade shows and presumably traveling to California, in your case, I assume. Um, in July. What, when you're, broadly speaking, Victoria, when you when you come to a show like Pulse, um, I, I, can I just ask very quickly, with a hands up, how many of you in the audience are um, designing, are here with um, stands designing? <laughs> about three three or four of you and how many of you are retailers okay good okay so um, what what sorts of things are you looking for when you I mean I'm not expecting you to give away the secret <laughs> absolutely well actually it'd be great if you did but um, what, what do you what are the most important things in a show like pulse that you're looking for new 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 I there is nothing else just new because if we already have relationships with suppliers we come here to say hello and be friendly and see if they've got any new things but we can generally manage that business on reorders and via email and phone calls but I think we come to shows to be presented with brand new product but when you say brand new are you talking about product or people companies brands you've never you've yes new all, all of the all above of it could be it, it can just be a new thing from an existing supplier but a, a whole new relationship is a lovely thing to find particularly if it's across a range of products so you feel that you can really develop what you're doing with that company that you you might buy a few things this show but then that will lead on to you know infinite numbers of reorders and then they'll introduce new product and you'll sort of stay with them I mean we are I think probably as a retailer we're quite loyal you know to to sort of core suppliers many of them we've been with for years and years and it's what that Zoe's saying about introducing new things to sort of refresh it well that's quite interesting as well because as a, I've only been going for a year so everything I've had it's all had to be paid for pro forma so everything is all up front so now I'm finally getting into that zone where I'm going on to invoice so and that's where they hook you in because you're like oh I'm gonna keep buying from you because I can invoice it rather than yeah. pro forma it so that, that that's quite interesting but I would say to designers don't copycat what you saw somewhere else because we're over it you know I just mm. look to the magazines I love magazines you like magazines yep. and what we're reading what we're looking for what are the travel stories what are the design stories what's going on on the catwalks because those are the color stories that we're thinking and, and, and thinking and projecting and thinking ahead and you know we want to be carried forward we want to work with um, suppliers that are progressive and exciting us and doing some thinking for us mm. ideally mm. so what I'm really picking up from both of you I think is 
as much as it's new things, it's presentation as well, and it's sort of mixing it all up in the shop and changing also, it. Also, how is it going to be merchandised? You know, I've, I've, there were some scissors that I wanted to buy the other day, and the designer dropped them off, and they were in a pencil case, and then that was in a box that was like. This is a chaos for my shelves. How on earth am yeah. I going to present that on the shelf? That's yeah. super complicated. But I also think the other thing with presentation, it is lovely to see a beautiful stand. It is really, really nice to see someone who's taken great care of their stand. But at the same time, we have to sort of divorce the product from the beauty of the stand because we're going to take it into our stores and make it look like we want to make it look. So, you know, a, a, a stand is a lovely eye-catching thing, but it only goes so far to selling a product because we've got to look at the product in isolation to some extent. And how, um, each of you, how important um, are Instagram? Do you, do you spend a lot of time on your social media? I mean, Instagram and... Twitter, perhaps, perhaps less so Twitter, and any of the other um, social media. Victoria, what, what, well, I, what's your attitude towards this? I have to embrace it. I think personally, it's not sort of, it's not so much where I am, but for, as a as a business, it absolutely is where we are. So I, you know, I have someone who runs our social media accounts. I don't tend to get involved, although I've been tasked with doing Instagram stories today <laughs> um, but you know I don't often get my hands on the phone um, yeah it's hugely important and Instagram I think is absolutely made for independent retail that is you know of all the social media platforms for me that's the perfect one because it is just little bite-sized beautiful images um, you don't have to be clever in your wordiness it's it's yeah. changing though because look at you know I've, I've always used Instagram to position us as a brand and a kind of the feelings always been if you kind of like my feed you're probably gonna like my product and you're gonna like my store because to me, I, it was the only social platform that I was ever on I wasn't yeah. on Facebook and I've always quite prided myself being quite off-grid bizarrely so I used it like that but now you can shop via instagram as of three four weeks ago i'm now trying to balance the audience against how would they feel about being thrown products rather than inspiration and how to tie that in and i've just signed up on a course that starts tomorrow you're very good to just a six-week course to try and explore instagram and make sure that i'm really keyed up and tooled up on it I haven't got a team well, yet. Can so. I just ask, what, what is the course? That's so fine. it's run by um, Sarah uh, Akwesombe, who runs, um, she's got a business called the No Ball School. Nice. So, and she is a, um, an influencer, most of you probably would have heard of her. And um, so, yes, yeah, she's, she's running the course. It's an online course and it's six weeks, so... I shall see what I know. I'm going to get you back here to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's really important. I think the selling thing is only a little part of what yeah. Instagram should be. Yeah. I see it as a window on the Hambledon world. But I think it's I changing. Think people are nosy. Mm. I think that they're more nosy than they are shoppy yeah. on Instagram. And that's what I sort of feel yeah. like we ought to give them. We always get way more likes if it's a photo of, you know, staff doing yes. something in store if it's an actual display in store they don't particularly people don't particularly no. respond to products that's they want yeah. the whole life of and i think that's where stories are so useful because they get to see people and then yeah. somebody was saying to me oh so you need to be in your stories more you've got to be in your stories more it's like oh god really and they're like, well oh, it depends yeah. how many people you've got working for you i yeah. always use other people so i don't have to be in <laughs> Well, um, I think we've learned a lot, um, what, what to do, what not to do, um, from both of you. And uh, I think it's incredibly brave to see you plowing on. Um, and I'm sure there's, you've got lots of questions. Um, would anyone like to ask Zoe or Victoria a question?
Hi. Um, I have a question in regards to finding the property, so especially in Shoreditch, um, because we know London is, uh, I don't know how it was 20 years back when we were looking uh, for the retail space, but right now, how did you um, go around to find the space? And you were saying that you got very lucky, so you can just go a bit more in detail. Yeah, of course. Um, I signed up with um, commercial property agents, and I um, was horrified <laughs> at the different places that they were taking me to. And um, But you just have to go around and see them all, and you just have to be really, really quick. Um, I was very, very lucky. The reason I got lucky was that my husband um, had rented big office spaces in London since 98 and has got a relationship with um, office property um, people and he just spoke to them and just said can you keep your eye can you keep your ear out please and that's how we got it and that's awful to say but I do not think I'd have got where I would have, where I am now without and um, without having that um, that help and the reason I say it was help because he worked for a very respected firm. It was Anton Page in London. Um, the landlords were aware of them, and they had. So when we were negotiating our deal, he was able to advise me on what sort of deal the landlord would be um, open and receptive to. So that entailed us having to pay six months' rent in advance. Um, so, so it was. So I think I had a I had a six month rent holiday. Oh, so I got when I moved yeah. in twenty no, years ago. I did get so I got three months free and then six months in advance. Yeah. So we had to put together that package, but I wouldn't have been able to construct that package in my head. I don't think without the help from from him. And I think it's really difficult if you're a new independent because you've got no weight of anything behind you in terms of financials. So. You know, a landlord would rather let a building to a multiple with a kind of history of trading yeah. than let it to a startup independent. And I can sort of understand from a point of view of security of tenure why they might feel like that. But I would say, yeah, just... Mm. Although presu presumably there are some landlords who might be more inclined, you were saying earlier, you know, that they want independence I mean no well not, not in my no. experience I think landlords want to maximize their return and I you know in a way I don't don't blame them for that I, I'm not sure that any change is really going to come from landlords because they want to get as much money as they can out of their properties I do think there will have to be some kind of legislation probably I just do not know how you phrase it. I mean, I haven't won one battle with my landlord. My landlord is, yeah, you know, bang, no, yes, no. He is, he, he they're no. not interested. They no, they because they can get someone yeah. else in, so mm. they don't need to be. Mm. Any more questions? Um, question for uh, Victoria. When you opened the Hambledon, was that your first and only location, or did you start smaller somewhere first? Well, what happened, my mum has always had a shop called the Hambledon Gallery in Dorset, and so I had kind of grown up working for my mum, lived in London for a long time, moved back to Dorset, worked with my mum, had this mail order business, and then thought, I'll have a shop. So we opened it originally as a branch of my mum's shop, um, so I, I suppose, in a way, I was fortunate because I was sort of coast. I was definitely coasting on her goodwill, um, and it was really only after about a year where we were trading very precariously, and my mum was sort of feeling that she didn't need to be trading precariously. Selling was it clothing predominantly? We then? no, we we've, we've always been a sort of. I mean, I hate the word lifestyle concept, but I honestly don't know what other term to describe us. We are a bit like a department store, but we've done all the choosing, so it's very sort of carefully edited. But yeah, we were selling across all categories at the time, except menswear, which was quite available. brave taking that size space with multiple categories. Yeah, but the thing is, <laughs> I, 
I looked around Winchester. I had a friend who knew an agent. So it is very helpful to know people. I had a friend who knew an agent. They showed me this site. Blazer were in it at the time, but wanted to get out. Once we'd seen it, it was the nicest building in Winchester. And I sort of thought, I don't really want anywhere else. This is the one I want. It was too big for us. When we opened, people came in and said, oh, are you closing down? <laughs> Um, but we've, you know, we've gradually filled it over the years. Yeah, it looks a bit more populated. Thank now. you. Any, any more questions? Thank you. It's very, very interesting to hear what you're saying. <laughs> um, you talked about re-merchandising the shop. How often do you do it, and is how is that reflected on your social media? Um, to look that to me. Um, I do it whenever I feel, so if you, well, always try and do it, I always try and do it every three weeks, maximum every four, and that means a real sort of reshuffle, but if you sell a really big piece, or if you sell anything that you've run out of stock, you have to do it every day anyway, it, it's, it's a fluid thing. Yeah, With or on any delivery. Anything, anything, everything has to be accommodated and, and moved around to accommodate it. Um, but I always, I've, so the, the team that I've built around me, I've, it's, so when you're choosing, when I've been choosing people to work within the shop for me, it's like, what qualities can you bring to the store that I haven't got? And one of the things that used to keep me awake at night before I opened was merchandising. It's like, oh, God, I just do not know how I'm going to do it. And um, so the team I've got are, you know, they're young and they want to be set designers and they want to be they don't really want to be working in double a green if i'm honest but they but they are and they're brilliant but they they've got and they've got qualities that i haven't got and they've got the confidence to try different things and i allow them to be playful um and have fun with the merchandise and i want people to enjoy the experience because that's important now that you know, ideally for myself, Shoreditch will be a playroom and a showroom and more of a showcase and an experiential um, adventure and online hopefully will take over. So in my head at the moment, I've got this dichotomy of do we get more shops or do we change Shoreditch and sell more online? And it, it, it's, it's that, that's what I'm going to be looking at next year. I think you have to be really, yeah, you have to be really certain what your brand is mm -hmm. before you think about rolling it out yeah. and how you roll it out. And I, I think high street retail is quite fraught yeah. at the moment, <laughs> quite fraught at the moment. But I'd say merchandise, try and be really theatrical. I think you, you, you want to engage people. That's what it's all about. So, you know, we try and change the windows. We've got two big windows and we change them every week because people are walking past and you don't really want them to walk past, you want them to walk in. So, but yeah, the more arresting, the better. Even if it's not particularly about selling something. Um, you know, some of our best windows have been almost nothing to do with um, stuff we sell. I think our best window was when we had teeny tiny photocopied corgis when it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee. We made hundreds of corgis we put them all on little um, collars, and then we had the leads going up to the sort of top of the window as if there was some god of corgi. But then we had Lucy who works with me, she has French bulldogs. So in amongst these hundreds of corgis, we had two French bulldogs. We haven't had a better response to a window. And I think people came in and bought things. They didn't buy corgis, but they bought lots of other things. And your window is so important. We sell so many things through the window. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, should we share one more, one more question? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very interested to hear what you're saying. Uh, one thing you haven't spoken about is the Royal Wedding. You're talking about merchandising. I'd love to know what the two of you are doing next, this week, next week. And then we're up to I feel a bit sad that you've asked me this very difficult question because we have been talking about the Royal Wedding for quite some weeks. I can't come up with a brilliant idea. I feel, no, I know, I feel really sad about it. I think we peaked with the corgis on our royalist window, and um, I don't know where to go from there. So, 
Anyway, over to you, wow. the royalist Zoe in the corner. <laughs> Interestingly, in the diary today, it's clan royal wedding window because it's going in tomorrow. Execute it quickly. <laughs> So what's going in your window? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Carmel, who um, is working today, is um, going to surprise me later this afternoon with a plan. It's interesting because we've got other new stock arriving on the 18th of May, which I'd quite like to um, showcase, and that's probably going to sell well over that weekend. So it's again that yeah, story. Yeah, we've got an it? absolutely amazing new women's wear collection. I'm, I'm loath not to put that in the window. Exactly. So you just think Megan's going away outfit. <laughs> It'll be the story. <laughs> Good. Well, I think I think that's um, incredible for both of you. Thank you so much. I mean, I've certainly learned a lot uh, from this talk. I hope you all have too. And I think you perhaps be around individually if anybody wants to ask a tour or so, so any, any questions but thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you